Good evening. At the top of the news tonight, risk. We've all heard that word, and it's not just a kid's board game from back in the day. As a dealership, we have a lot of exposure to risk. And um, welcome to another episode of Sunday Night Live, where we talk about all things automotive. And this week, I'm bringing on an expert in the area of risk. Mr. Tom Klein, he's got over 30 years experience in our automotive business, most of that as a dealer. So let me bring him on. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me, Paul. Great to be here. So for those few people that may not know Tom Klein, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, how you got started, some of your history, and uh, then we'll jump right into it. That sounds great. Glad to be here on Sunday Night Live. Uh, my family, Paul, actually started in the car business in 1925. My grandfather was in the car business. Uh, he started a Chevrolet dealership in 1925. And uh, my father went out. My father was working for him and then went out on his own in 1964 and started the dealership that I worked at. And so I'm a third generation car guy. Uh, so wow. it's, it's, it's literally in my DNA. Uh, and my, interestingly, my family's been in the car business almost a hundred years. So, wow. so what is that? 40% of the, of the age of the nation, right? So, yeah. so we've, uh, we've been around car dealerships quite a lot. So, uh, I started in the business in 1991. That's excluding uh, me being a, uh, what I called, I was told I was a lot attendant. I didn't like that because the title wasn't good enough. So I turned myself into a lot automotive placement engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, packaging, right? say again, it's all about the packaging. Absolutely. Branding, right? Everybody wants to talk about branding. I was a lot automotive placement engineer. So uh, outside of my summers for doing that, sweeping the gravel when the when the lot was uh, not paved back in the day. Um, yeah. So I worked my way through the departments in the uh, in the office and on, obviously in sales in the office. Uh, I was deemed my brother. Who I worked with my brother. He called me in his office one day and said, I just fired the collection manager for doing cocaine. So you're now the collection manager. So I was the collection manager for 17 years. And then amongst doing the all the insurance things that I was doing and, uh, and, and, and solving the customer problems. And that's actually how I got into solving customer problems is because I was the collection manager. So anytime that there was a problem, they would call me and scream and yell at me. Um, plenty of, uh, good stories there as the collection manager, but anyway, I, I worked, uh, handling the insurance, handling the collections, uh, handling the disputes and, uh, handling compliance. So all of those things, uh, I handled together for, I guess, 20, 25 years, whatever it was. And, uh, we sold the dealership in. December of 2019, and then I started my consulting business, Better Vantage Point. Wow, that's great. That, that's that's a lot of years in the car business. That is a lot of years in the car business. Did they tell you at the time when you got into it that nobody ever gets out? Because that's a disclaimer that that people always tend to forget to tell anybody that gets into our business. What's the what was the movie The Godfather? You get in, but you don't get out. Isn't that what it yeah, was? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> car business is the same. <laughs> so we got a couple they of folks. They don't, the let, they don't. They don't let you out. No, no. But but even you know, I go to events and I talk to some of these old timers, and I joke with them. I say, Hey, listen, you know, nobody ever gets out, huh? And they're like, Yeah, I tried for a, a couple of years, but. I had to get back in. Nobody, right. literally, nobody ever gets out. It. It's it's pretty funny. <laughs> so we got a couple of comments. We have Mr. Charles Higgins, Drive with Charles. Says, hey, Paul Meyer, and welcome, Tom Klein. Thank you, Terry Charles. Caroline. Tom hey, Klein Terry. is going to be great. 
I thought you were already great. How are you, how are you going to be great? I thought you were already Terry's, great. Terry's part of my public relations crew. Okay. Ron <laughs> Usher, my favorite retired master tech, says hello everyone, and Christine Mitchell, the car lady. The car lady. I Hi, love Christine. this. Hello. I love the car lady. We had a nice call the other day. It was it was really enjoyable. And Mark Williamson, what's up, guys? Michael Dean Offmuth, hello, guys. Welcome to the show. All right, awesome stuff. You know, when I think of risk, when I think of compliance, and I think of a dealership, I can't tell you how many dealerships I walk into where that little thing, uh, what was that thing? Safeguarding of customer information, something to that right. effect. Right. Where you're not supposed to have stuff out. And right. I see stacks and stacks of papers with customer information just left out. And what are, what is the fine for something like that? It's forty. It's forty three thousand and change per incident. So if you have a stack of deals that aren't done, yeah. Excuse me. Better get out your checkbook. Wow. So when you're talking about a big store where there's a lot of salespeople and there's a lot of stacks. It could get out. It could get ugly real quick. Very quick. When I when I go see my uh, my dealer clients, the first thing that I advocate is that they put hinges on the F and I door so the do so the door closes automatically. Yeah. And then either either a combination lock or a key, so that nobody can get into the F and I offices, and that's secured first. And then secondly, I make sure the sales tower is secured. Uh, so that you just can't wander into the sales tower because that's where the second biggest pile of, of information is for somebody who yeah. would be looking to have their identity stolen. Uh, and I've had my identity stolen and that was not fun. That's just another story we can get to maybe. And then the third of the salesman's desk. So the salesman should be instructed and should sign off on this. They should sign off on a policy. Yeah. That either they're going to give the customer information to the manager at the end of the day, or if they have locked desks, that's perfectly fine too. But it's a it's a huge exposure. So I guess that opens up the first topic is, um, you know, how many dealers have a compliance management system or CMS, and typically whose responsibility is that? Well, it's a great question, Paul, because uh, the dealerships that I see are lacking in this area. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, mandates that dealers have a compliance management system. Now, they want the dealers to have that uh, be a software solution in the cloud, but it's okay if you don't. As far as I'm concerned, a good old three ring binder is a good way to start. So, and I advocate, uh, you know, for 20 bucks, you're in business, right? Here's your three ring binder and off you go. First thing that's important for a dealership to do is to write uh, and sign a compliance charter. And if anybody wants one of those, they can contact me after we're done or contact you. And we'll make sure we get them a copy of a compliance manage management charter. Awesome. But, but what that says is, you know, our, our compliance officer is this person and it has to be defined and they're going to be responsible for making sure that a compliance management system is um, implemented and maintained. And what a compliance management system is basically is if a customer complains, you have to document it and then document the solution. And so however you want to do that is fine as long okay. as you are as long as you are doing it. Wow, I'm 41 plus years in the business and I've not worked for too many stores, but I don't remember one store where I recall someone being deemed that person. I do remember at one of the stores I worked at, uh, a few gentlemen from the FBI had come in and uh, there was some issue with a customer I don't know how that ended, but but I can't imagine it ended too well. <laughs> I've had I've had so many law enforcement folks in my office over the years, FBI, 
uh, the the Secret Service, which you know they handle part of the Treasury function. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is there is and all kinds of regulators. What's interesting is that each it seems like each branch of the government has their own regulatory or enforcement uh, body. For example, um, and, and everybody, when I was at the dealership, everybody was only too happy when somebody came in and flashed a badge. They were like, go see Tom. If, it, if they had a badge, go see Tom. They don't want to, you know, it was always go see me. So I had the um, housing and urban development enforcement staff come to my office one day and you'd think why would hud need a police force right what sense does that make but in right. this case they they wanted to see a deal because the person apparently living in government subsidized housing had bought like a used tahoe and so they wanted to see his credit app to see what he put on his credit app to see if he should be in government housing. So, ah, as so, opposed to federal housing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if, if you don't have somebody in compliance who can feel these types of things, they, they get bigger. The problems get bigger. That's the thing about a car dealership is if you have a customer problem or an employee problem, they need to be resolved promptly because the best resolution is the quickest resolution, which also ends up being the least expensive resolution, 100% right. of the time. We've got Sandy Zanino, my friend. She says the Tom and Paul, or the Paul and Tom show. Great topic, and Tom is such a wonderful resource and expert. Thanks, Sandy. Sandy. And Steve Apicella, how people are trained, extremely important. How we follow up on that training, essential. So, 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 so let me address Stephen's comment for a second. Yeah. Um, I had mentioned earlier that employees should sign off on a policy. If you have a policy, which you should, about leaving customer information out, all the employees should sign acknowledgments and put them in their personnel files. And when a regulator comes and says, you left all these things out, and why? First thing you're gonna do, of course, is go back to your policy and say, well, we have a policy, we have everybody sign it, and then when new employees come on, we have everybody sign it, and we reinforce it on a yearly basis, and we have everybody sign it. So I apologize that we had all these violations, but it wasn't because we're not concerned, we're not, it's not because we're not trying, we are trying, we made a mistake. And if you can demonstrate that, the check that you write is generally gonna be a lot less than if you're not doing that kind of training and you're not having employees sign off on all kinds of policies. That's, that's, a, that's a great policy. I mean, I, I could certainly understand that if I came in as a regulator or someone with a badge and somebody showed me that as opposed to I don't know. I mean, that, that there's a big difference there. So big difference. the question I have for dealers is, when was the last enterprise risk assessment to ensure all assets are protected done? And who's looking at the big picture? How often does that get done, Tom, in your experience? Every dealer that I go into, it's not very often. Sometimes the large chains um, who have tens and hundreds of millions of dollars at risk uh, are a lot more cognizant of these things yeah. than the two or three rooftop dealerships. Um, but let me tell you first what an enterprise risk assessment is. That's a process that, that I go through with a dealer to find out where the chinks in the armor are. Where could they get sued? Where could they have a problem. I'll give you a good example from this week is I have a dealer client who I've been advocating that he get pollution insurance. And a lot of you'd be surprised a lot of dealers don't have pollution insurance. And pollution insurance covers, you know, the used oil and the used tires and the used battery and, the, and what happens to all of those things. And if they're not disposed of properly, 
the dealer ends up being not only liable from a corporate perspective, but they can be held liable if um, if the the waste goes into a Superfund site, because that's joint and several liability. So a dealer I've been talking to for three or four months who just didn't get around to getting his pollution policy got a 500-page lawsuit where he was one of the named defendants this week. So because his his 164 gallons of some substance, which we haven't found out what it is yet, was discovered on the Superfund site. And so now he has to deal with that problem. Wow. I mean, there's so many things that, that people don't think about. All right. So I see somebody coming through as LinkedIn user. I'm thinking it might be Lamont. Uh, is Lamont, is that you coming through saying good evening, gentlemen? It says LinkedIn user. And Mark Williamson, you have to show proper intent. Yeah, that's that's spot on because if, if at least you've tried, that's, that's a whole lot different than uh, just throwing your arms up in the air and saying right. nothing's done. Now, who so, typically trains right. somebody in the store on the on the compliance stuff? Uh, good question. Who does train the people at the store on compliance? I, you know, there are a lot of stores, I guess, who are big enough. They have somebody in-house who are training on a regular basis. I advocate twice a month and have that sign-off sheet, right? That's 26 different topics per year that you can cover, which is a goodly amount, right? If you do it every two weeks uh, during your sales meeting, doesn't take long, 15 minutes, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say every two weeks? Every two weeks. Every two weeks. That's what I advocate. 104 times a year. No, no. It's 26 times a year. Or 20, I'm sorry, 26 times a year. Yeah, yeah. 26 times a year. The other way. Yeah, you went wow. the other way. So, In 41 years, I don't remember that training once. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I understand. But just getting, just covering back, going back for a minute, the enterprise risk assessment, I got off on a tangent on the pollution insurance, but you know, it's where are the chinks in the armor and where are you vulnerable as a dealer? Another example is I have a client who um, just renewed their physical damage on their automobiles. Some people call that the auto ADPD or auto dealers physical damage. And we, I looked at his policy and I said, you don't have a weather aggregate. Now, a weather aggregate means if a hurricane comes or a flood or anything happens to the inventory, how much money would you be out? So we, we, we say the what if, right? In this particular yeah. case, this particular case, this dealer typically had 600 cars and had a thousand dollar deductible on their wind hail. So if all of their vehicles got got damaged, not totaled, but just damaged more than a thousand dollars, dealer has to write a check for six hundred thousand. Right? A six hundred times a thousand is six hundred thousand right. dollars. So a weather aggregate caps that amount, and you can negotiate that with your insurance company or you can get a separate policy depending on what your situation is, but it would cap that amount at a hundred thousand or fifty thousand or two hundred and fifty thousand, so that you didn't have to write a check for six hundred thousand. So we have to weigh the economic benefit of is it you know will you sleep better at night? Is it worth right. the is it worth the you know the the scales of justice right? Is it worth Paying that money, which could be a standalone policy, could be fifty to seventy thousand dollars. Yeah. So, so is it worth paying that fifty to seventy thousand dollars to protect the potential of writing a check for six hundred thousand? How many people even know that that policy exists? I don't know. A, a lot. A lot don't. I would say a lot don't. And so when we're talking about an enterprise risk assessment, this takes a long time to do. You can, I can go in and do it in a couple of weeks time, 
but yeah. it's a tremendous amount of information, right? Because you're reviewing all of the, the back end of the business, right? Not yeah. the sales end, but this is the back end. You have to review all of the particulars and understand how that dealer operates in order to be able to come up with what the, uh, where the risk is, what you can do about it. Uh, and not everything is right as an insurance policy. Some things are just policies and procedures you have to install to make sure that certain things happen. Right. We have Amanda Sorrell says, hello, everyone. Welcome, Amanda. Good evening, it Amanda. It was Lamont. It was Lamont that coming through as LinkedIn user. I think it's a privacy setting or something. I, I, I sent them something uh, a while back, but that must still be acting up. So you need to know from an insider's point of view, certainly, 30 years experience, uh, most of it in the dealership as uh, a, a, a member of the family that owned that dealership, you have a pretty good exposure as to, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and coming up with a, a kind of a list of, of what types of things you need to look for and be on the lookout for. Whereas today, time is such a premium, it, it seems like you know, most places you walk into, their the bulk of their day is spent putting out fires, much right. less proactively uh, looking at some of these areas of exposure. It's more or less, oh man, something just went down. Now we we're forced to look at it because now we have a potential uh, expense that we hadn't planned on. Right. Otherwise, no, that risk exposure. Well, my, uh, my, my company slogan is we get you out of trouble and keep you out of trouble. So that's, uh, w which is patented by the trademark office, by the way, service mark. Uh, but yeah, so I, I'll get calls sometimes. Uh, a good example, if I can give you a good example, where uh, a dealer called me was going to get arrested because uh, the story went that the dealer bought a vehicle from a kid who we'll call George. And George ended up forging his father's name to the title. When the father found out, the father took out a warrant because he thought the dealer was on the inside with George. So the police turned it over to the DMV. The DMV went out to the dealer and said, unless you pay the father $26,000, I'm going to arrest you because the because the the vehicle that they bought they considered stolen. Right. So right. so the dealer called me to unravel that, right? And so so he had a problem, and and these are the problems that come up, and and that's what I do is I'm a problem solver. So. How, how does it typically work? Somebody can't, reaches out to you, you schedule what, like a discovery call to see where they're at based on all of the things that you do and, and then come up with a report of sorts? Well, when, when I get a call and, and the dealer wants to know what I do and how I do it, I schedule a complimentary work session, uh, a Zoom call where I don't charge for that and we talk through whatever the problem or problems are. Uh, and I'll do up to two one-hour complimentary sessions. And then usually by the end of that second session, they're interested in knowing how I work. That's usually how it comes to pass. And then I suppose it's, it depends on how, how bad each particular store is. But is this a, is this a, a thing you, you take weeks to resolve? or is this an ongoing kind of on retainer type of thing? How, how does that work? Well, it depends on, you know, in the situation with the title uh, where the dealer did nothing wrong, uh, that was uh, a flat fee. I just said, here's, you know, here's what my fee is and I'll resolve it no matter how long it takes, I'll take it to the very end. Yeah. But typically when you're doing, when you're, when you're working on the three areas of dispute resolution, compliance and risk transference those are what i call the three legs of the stool and any which if you pull the leg out the stool falls over so and and that's really what dealers should be focused on in my opinion are, are those three things the dispute resolution 
whether it's your customers or your employees, okay. um, compliance and um, risk transference. Now, the biggest compliance issue I see with dealers is um, advertising. Okay. Lack of lack of proper disclaimers. Uh, it's it's a you it's mean a, the the very small two font. Two two point font. Yes. Yeah. It's right. about this tall, <laughs> and nobody can read it. Even with a magnifying glass, you blow it up, but it's like a a, a picture that's too small. When you blow it up, you can't read it. Right. Well, the Federal Trade Commission is getting very aggressive about this. Uh, they just closed a dealer group uh, last year in Arizona. I believe it was called Tate Automotive um, for predatory practices. One of them was uh, advertising violations. And then the other one that they recently did, which was last year, uh, was Bronx Honda. And Bronx Honda was discriminating uh, and had advertising problems. How, how common are the advertising issues? And are, are they honest mistakes? Or are they just blatant? They don't know what the policy is. And as a result of that, they're just, they just don't care. It's mostly, it's mostly a, a lack of uh, diligence in my part, uh, in my opinion. I mean, um, the uh, NADA has a guide that's free to dealers. Uh, it's, it's a guide to advertising. And I, as I recall, I haven't looked at it in about nine months, but I believe it's like less than a hundred pages and it's free to dealers. So I would have, I would tell dealers to start there as far as the federal laws go and the state laws are all different. California is completely different than, uh, uh, than the rest. So, but you have to start with the federal laws and then work your way down from there. What about uh, consumer complaints? Um, you know, do, do a lot of stores have mechanisms within the store to, to properly channel and address those? Well, I find, Paul, that, that consumer complaints are... are it, it, I'd say the majority of the time they're not being handled as well as they could. How's that for a good spin? Um, I think that first of all, everyone uh, knows about what they call reputation management. Yeah. I think that I think that term is really erroneous. I think, and I call it reputation mitigation, because what you're really trying to do is is what you really should be doing in my opinion is you should be posting a comment something very neutral not arguing your case um and and i've got a lot of good funny ones excuse me where dealers love to argue their whole case on the internet like they want to make their whole argument which which of course when when buyers go to read reviews which what 80 or 90% statistically go to read reviews before they buy a new car they see all that and they scratch their head and say what what are these what are these people doing so so the right way to do it in my opinion is you post a response and then this is the secret sauce you ready then you pick up the phone and you call the customer and you ask the customer to come into the dealership so you can fix the problem. And then you fix it. You fix it. I don't care. And, and there's, there, often there's a, a, um, a paradigm of, well, we didn't do anything wrong. And, and why should we spend any money on this? And these people lied on their credit application or whatever it is. There's a hundred different excuses. But that's completely wrong. You want to resolve these problems for two reasons. Number one, you don't want these people out there upset because these are people who will go to lawyers, they'll go to regulators, they'll, they'll go to other websites, they'll post until they can't post anymore. And so when you reach out, you get the customer in, you resolve their problem, then you ask the customer to update 
their review and it goes something like this you say these these reviews really hurt my feelings because we work really hard at abc motors to make sure that that everyone is satisfied and if you wouldn't mind would you please update your review to reflect that we're not such bad guys after all now don't ask them to change it because if you ask right. them to change the review then they feel manipulated sure and then they go crazy again well. <laughs> Consumers have lots of avenues where they can air their grievances. And I recall uh, one particular store that I was doing business with, the manager just couldn't leave stuff alone online. <laughs> and some of the exchanges that I would see go back and forth, I would just be mortified. Right, right. it's cringeworthy. That yeah, that anybody would would even respond in that way. And uh, another one I saw was a uh, a veteran had purchased a car from a dealership, and apparently it broke down very short time afterwards. There's some stuff that should have been done that wasn't done. So he went back to the store live on YouTube. Right. And the, the reaction from the store, they were just verbally abusing this guy live online. It ended up going viral, that video. I'm sure. And these guys were just going crazy. Now, yeah. Michael Barrich has a question. He says, don't forget the service drive. Right. Very interested in that. Talk to me yeah. about what he's talking about. So, uh, Michael, if, uh, if I understand what you're asking, the online reviews when people post are both for service and for sales. And so I advocate the same thing. If a customer was upset because their oil change took too long or you didn't fix the car right the first time and it's a be back, whatever that issue is, bring them in, give them some love. Um, a couple of ways to give love without spending a lot of money. People really appreciate lunch out right? Lunch out to Ruby Tuesdays or Chili's or anything, you know, $25 gift certificates for lunch out. People love it. Say, hey, I'm really sorry we didn't meet your expectations. I Let me give you lunch out on us and I hope you'll consider using us again. Uh, a service credit is a great way to uh, handle customer complaints because as we all know, you know, the, the, uh, the cost to fix something is roughly 50% and 50% is is profit. So if you give somebody a $100 credit in the service department to come back and try you again, then you're encouraging repeat business, number one. Number two, that $100 is only costing you 50. Right. And if the customer never comes in, then you've spent nothing. This is true. But you've made the gesture nonetheless. You're trying. Times, even if they don't come back, you know, somebody could be happy knowing that you've even made the gesture to try to, to try to straighten out their situation. Does that answer your question, Michael? If not, type it in the, uh, in the comments, please, and I will go back to it. So yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about the effort, Paul. It really is. And, and, and you're not always going to resolve a problem the first time that you meet with the customer. And by the way, you can't do this by telephone. You can't do it by email. The customer actually has to come in. You have to right. be able to stay across the desk. This is old school, but the old school, take it offline, bring them in. Bring them in. Yep. Do a lot of stores have something in place for that, or, or is it really like rolling the dice? It's a little it's a little less organized than I would really like it to be. And that's one of the first things when we're talking about risk um, enterprise risk assessment. Remember, problems come three ways, in my opinion, the two legged kind, which is customer problems and employee problems and then advertising problems. Those are the three biggest areas. So if you can stop the online problems or have a mechanism Maybe it can be either centralized or decentralized, right? Sales can handle theirs, service can handle theirs, or you can have somebody who kind of straddles both worlds. 
and can can resolve it. But it, it's important that that uh, the dealership take a look at all these websites. And there's really there are 30 to 40 different websites that they should check on a monthly basis. But some of the big ones they should check on a daily basis, which is Google, Yelp, Facebook, um, um, Dealer Raider, Pissed Consumer, uh, My Three Cents. These are some of the ones. And Glassdoor. Um, for those are for those who don't know Glassdoor, Glassdoor is a website where employees can go online and yep. rate the employer. And any uh, of of the younger crowd is going to go look at Glassdoor before they come interview with your company. You can bet on it. Yeah, I get their emails all the time. Even <laughs> old guys know about Glassdoor. <laughs> Even old guys. And I'm sure Sandy has a, an opinion about Glassdoor that she can share with us. Uh, maybe she can be your next guest and, uh, and talk about Glassdoor a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would love that. I get so many emails from them. And, uh, you know, each time there's a new review on a particular company, they, they send that out. So you get notified. Right. That's exactly I right. I try to be on top of everything. I try to be on top of the... Uh, of the, the dealership side. And I also try to be on top of, you know, the employees at the dealership side. Right. What they're saying, because a lot of times, you know, you can get a good gauge for what a business is about by the grievances that the employees air or don't air online. And all of this stuff is so easy to, to track. And you can even set up alerts, and I, and I suppose there are probably there's probably plenty of programs that um, you know monitor this kind of stuff, so that you can be alerted and and take care of the problems as they happen. Of course, the best resolution is always avoiding the situation to begin with. Right. Sandy so, taught me something. Sandy taught me something this year, which I want to share, which is you should. Um, treat your employees like your internal customers. Yeah, and I, and I like and I like that. And so I've borrowed it, stolen it, but I do uh, when I do use it, Sandy. I do use your name. So just so you know, there's a guy by the name of Steve De Filippo. He owns the Davio's North America uh, Northern Italian Steakhouses. Um. I think he probably owns about 12 of them at this point. I'm not sure I lost count, but I, I've been to eight of them. And in his book, it's all about the guest. He talks about his employees as his internal guests. And that's, it's very important uh, to, to do that because what's that guy, Branson? Take care of your employees and your employees will take care of your customers. Right. And, and one of the mistakes, Paul, that I see that dealerships make all the time or a lot is they don't have a mechanism for employees to complain. If they, for example, if their boss is the problem, is there yeah. a policy, if, is there a policy in place that everyone knows if their boss is a problem that they can go see the general manager, they can go see the dealer uh and 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 how how does that you know how does that work i have a solution i have one solution there's lots of solutions called alwaysdobetter.com which is the sign you see over my shoulder here and that is a, like a digital comment box uh so that so that in both employees and and customers know that their voice can be heard and that there's a third party, which is me, I'm the third party, who's collecting feedback and giving it back to the dealership. Uh, and, and so that's what that's about. There's a QR code and, uh, and they can use their phone and they can go in and type a comment and, and it'll get submitted and I'll, I'll send it to the dealer. So it doesn't really matter what kind of methodology you use, but do your employees know where they can go with the problem? Instead of going, and again, Problem started dealership one of three ways, customers, employees, and advertising. Do the employees know that they can come see you 
instead of going to the EEOC and causing you all kinds of grief and problems and time and lawyers fees and 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 all those kinds of things. Sandy says I have opinions for sure. And she says, yes, OMG, someone listens to me. I think everybody listens to you, Sandy. Everybody listens to Sandy. It says, can't go wrong with flipping the lens this way. An important point, Tom. Employers have lost cases because the reporting mechanism in the policy was too narrow. Well, the reporting mechanism that I've usually uh, seen over the, the decades is there's a verbal altercation typically on the showroom floor that tends to get loud both the manager and the and the salesperson go into the the owner's office and the salesperson is typically escorted out of the building uh, <laughs> shortly thereafter that conversation so i've not seen too many too many mechanisms this is something new or has this been around forever and just not enough people are utilizing it I think it's been, I think the notion of having a way to resolve issues with employees has been around quite a long time. Now, how you handle that is, you know, is up to you. And dealers will use a legal rights agreement in their guidebook to uh, tell uh, employees what they need to do if they have a problem. I mean, if, if there should be more than one way of doing it it should be a hey we're you know here's the warm and friendly way but if you go the wrong yeah. way then you know then how is it handled now i i can tell you that uh, from some of the larger corporations that i've worked for yes that's in that big stack of paperwork that you have to sign before you start day one right but on the dealer level, I, I really am, I don't recall ever, ever seeing it. Right. And in any you know, of the stores that work. One of the, I'm a little old school on one topic when it comes to this, which is I personally don't like the employee guidebook. And by the way, I call it a guidebook, not a handbook. And the subtlety there is, is small, but a handbook has connotations that everything is contained there. And we know at a dealership, policy, new policies are made all the time. All the time. Never, and they never catch up. So a guidebook guides you. And I, so I like that terminology a little bit better. But I'm old school and I don't like the guidebook being online. Because typically when a, an employee has a problem, if it's not online, let's just say it's a, you know, it's a, it's a book. Typically that employee is going to call the personnel department. And they're going to say, what's our policy on ABC? And if there's somebody smart handling human resources, they're going to contact somebody and say, so-and-so's upset. Somebody should call and get it straight. Right? So you get a heads up. It's like a, it's like a, it's a freebie. It's a get out of jail free because, yeah. because you know, they didn't keep their guidebook. They threw it in the garbage can on day one. Right. I mean, that's, that's what happens. But if you put it online, you don't get that bite at the apple. So I like having the physical book. That's just my opinion. And I'm sure there are all kinds of schools of thought on that. Sandy's Tom's solution encourages participation much more than internal policies. Employees elsewhere do not trust HR and are afraid of retaliation from HR and managers. Okay. I, I like, I encourage participation. I encourage open door. So um, I, I think it just, it, it helps everybody get on with it, right? So you can get on with, with, with the, the business or running the business instead of having disgruntled employees. Well, I like the fact that if they're contacting somebody that's a, a, a neutral third party, uh, I would tend to, to feel that that's a safer place to do it. And they'd be more inclined to to do it as opposed to, you know, as Sandy says, the fear of retribution is real. Sure it is. They sure think is. that the manager has been there forever. The, the HR person has been there forever. You not so much. 
you know, <laughs> there's really no incentive. How are, why are they going to stick up for you as opposed to a third party that's going to neutrally present that to both sides? Right. And I've heard, I've heard variously, some people like to poll their employees. Um, that's not my favorite way of doing it. I think there's, there's, I think the managers should be more in tune uh, with emotional intelligence to what's going on with their employees. And if the managers don't understand the, what emotional intelligence is, then the dealers should train them so that they can watch what's going on. Because uh, if a manager doesn't handle their employees with emotional intelligence, you're going to have problems. Did you say Paul? Beg your pardon? Did you say Paul? Poll, yes, P O L L. Like a spear. Like a spear. <laughs> that kind of polling. Yeah, well, they might do that too. <laughs> Barbecuing. <laughs> <laughs> um, do most dealerships have a guidebook? Is, is that something that's standard practice, or is that more so in, in some of the larger groups? Most dealerships have something. Uh, most, most do. They always can be updated. Uh, and there's a lot of important information that comes out on a regular basis. Uh, that if you have it, if you do have it electronically, that is one of the ways that that it does help. If you have your employee guidebook uh, in the cloud, you can update it, and everybody can have to sign off on the updates and that kind of thing. So it makes it a little easier to update your policies. But you know, every couple, two or three years, you should take pull, Pull it off the shelf, dust it off, uh, talk to your employment counsel or talk to talk to someone like me and 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 see what the you know what's changed. Uh, certainly there's gonna be everybody should have COVID policies by now. Certain states require you to have it in writing and and you know, who knows what's gonna happen with that and whether we're gonna have other, you know, we're down to the move variant now. So you, who knows how how long that goes on, but but the epidemiologists that I've heard talk say it's going to go on for quite a while. So yeah, that's certainly something important to update because the, talk about exposure, right? Right. There's got to be tremendous amount of liability exposure. Uh, well, that's still like that. that's still as I understand it, that's still being argued in Congress because. The Republicans have been asking for, and I don't know what the status of that is at the moment, but the Republicans have been wanting to make sure that businesses are not held liable if employees get COVID. And that's been going around for the last, whatever, year, year and a half. Well, the some of that, you're right, that that's changing as we're having the conversation. Because, for instance, when... Um, you know, the pandemic first came around, you were not able to sue if you had a family member, let's say, that, that died in a nursing home, as, as we did. Um, you, you're not able to, sorry to hear that. sue them. Thank you. Terrible. You're not able to sue them, but that changed. After a certain amount of period of time, that, that changed because I, I guess now that we know more about it and we know more of the the safeguards, then by not following some of those, then we assume that risk, right? I mean, sure. we open ourselves up to it. So, sure, yeah, that got to be constantly changing. Yep, and and OSHA OSHA is looking for that. They, it, you know, one of the things I know of a dealership in the last month, uh, OSHA went in, and one of the first things they asked for is, "Do you have a written COVID policy?" And if you don't. That's a problem. If you don't, you're just going to be standing there going, yeah, we're really, like, we're really good guys. Yeah, too many unknowns. Right. Uh, let me ask you this one now. What about arbitration uh, for settling disputes? Um, is, is that common practice also, or is it, is it more or less customers filing the lawsuit and I'll see you in court? It, it people do use arbitration. I'm not a fan of arbitration because you what you're trying to do is build. If if you have a problem, you have to get again. 
get the customer back in the store and try to build trust back so that you can get to a solution. But right. with, ar with arbitration, both parties have to pay to resolve the problem. So think about how, how ironic it is that you're trying to resolve a problem while you're asking the person who you pissed off to pay to fix the problem. What sense does that make? Right. You're, I mean, the customer doesn't want to, the customer's just going to get more pissed that they have to write a check to try to get to a forum to try to resolve their problem instead of somebody, again, picking up the phone and saying, come on in here, let's get this fixed. Yeah, <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> now, what about this? Uh, how about preparedness for local media stories? Right. Who, who has a plan for that? If they have me as a consultant, they'll have a plan. Um, just some, some, some tips. For example, if the, if the news, the local, first of all, local news needs more news. So that's why they do these consumer stories is because they need the stories, right? Right. So one of the typical things that happens is they'll ask for a comment and a lot of dealers won't give a comment on camera. And so they'll submit a comment in writing. Well, one of the big mistakes they make is they use their own letterhead. Right? So everybody sees your comment with your letterhead. You don't want your letterhead on there. You want a plain white piece of paper. You don't want, a, you don't want all the money and the time and, and the years of investment you've put on your logo. You don't want to put that on the local news. That's, that's the wrong way to go. So, you know, in, in terms of having a media um, preparedness, uh, one person should be that person. Everybody in the dealership should know. So if the news crew comes in, they go, you know, go see him, right? And then that person should be skilled enough to say, tell me what we're talking about. Happy to look into it. And you can come back and you can get me on camera once we've gotten to the bottom of the facts. But we need right. to talk about, we need to talk about the facts. And then sometimes I've been successful at at um, at showing the news media the fact that they don't have the facts, that here are the facts, and this really isn't a story that's something you want to report because the facts are very detrimental to the customer. And and an and example or two, I've been able to get the news station to um not have them mention the dealership's name they still did the report because usually by the time by the time they come and roll up on your dealership they already have the customer on film right it's rare, it's rare that they'll come to the dealership and start wanting to talk about it not having already had the customer you know as they say in the business in the can so right. so once they have the customer in the can there's going to be a story. It's just a whether or matter if you can stay out of it or not. That's when they show up with the pitchforks and the torches. <laughs> exactly. The damage has basically already been done. Now it's just cementing the story. Right. That's right. And so you know, it's funny. And again, it's typically larger organizations have people designated for those responsibilities. But right. most of the other ones don't. Right. It's just, you know, who, whoever happens to be talking or standing up front at the particular time is typically the person that handles that. And that's usually the, the wrong way to do it. Because there's no preparedness. That's right. And if you're handling your customer problems the way you should, there shouldn't be news, right? There shouldn't be news right. story because because you're going online and I'm not telling you that there's not an occasional red herring because of course there is, but for the most part, you can eliminate most of your risk, most of your exposure by making sure you have good uh, customer policies. If a customer is upset, you get them back in, you fix the problems. You know, that reminds me of a story of me 
years ago, I had a, an issue with uh, a couple of dry cleaners. And the first one would only reimburse me 50% for the shirt that they damaged. At first right. they said, oh, no, you only brought four shirts. I said, well, that's funny because I worked five days. So I know I brought in five shirts. This is now my first trip to the laundromat. So I left, I went to the next one. I said, Let, I explained what happened. I told them how pissed I was. I said, look, if you want to do my shirts, I'll bring you all my dry cleaning. But if you screw up my shirts, you're going to pay for all of it, not 50% of it. You're going to pay for 100%. The guy had the nerve to accuse me of having a bad attitude. <laughs> but finally, he said, OK, I'll do your shirts. Well, not two weeks later, uh, ink from other shirts transferred onto my custom-made shirts. I mean, I picked these out, the fabric, the cuff, the collar, the pocket, everything. The monogram. I said, um, you owe me for the shirts. He says, no, I don't. It didn't happen here. I said, really? So I picketed the dry cleaner. I took the shirt. I put them on like a, a T, a scarecrow T thing, stapled them. I had signs made up, and I walked the picket line in front of the dry cleaner. At first, he's looking at me like I'm crazy. But I was really pissed because I spent a lot of money on shirts. Not now, but then I spent crazy money on, on custom shirts and suits. Right. So finally, on the second day, this woman pulls up. She's got a big load of laundry. She's about to walk to the front door. She stops. She turns to me and she says, what happened? I explained what happened. She says, that's terrible. I'm never coming here again. She puts her laundry back in the car. The big beamer drives off. She's gone. Dry cleaner comes out. He says, hey, buddy, come here. I said, no, no, you come here. He said, do you have the receipts for the shirts? I said, no, you told me to go pound sand. So I didn't go get the receipts. But this is how much you owe me plus tax. He goes inside. He gets the money. And he pays me every penny for the two shirts that he ruined. A good chunk of money. Now, it was a good thing that he did that because... After he did that, I put my picket stuff back in the car and I took out my cell phone and I made two phone calls. The first one was to Channel 12 News, the television station, to tell them that the problem has been resolved. There's no need to send the news crew out that was coming out to cover the human interest story. The second phone call was to the Fairfield Citizen News, the local newspaper, to tell them they don't need to send a reporter out because the, the dry cleaner chose to do the right thing. So to your point, if you do the right thing, you're not gonna expose yourself to a situation like that. That's right. And then one, one last point I wanna uh, just ask you about. Uh, we talked about pricing irregularities and things like that, but there's gotta be a lot of stuff on websites that aren't uh, compliant with the advertising law. So is that something that, that a lot of dealers spend much time even looking at? You know, I, I don't find many dealers spend much time looking at that. So it is, it, I mean, I was reviewing a website today and there was, there was no asterisks after the price to then talk about plus taxes, tag, uh, license and processing fee. And the Federal Trade Commission considers if you don't have that disclaimed properly, yep. that it's actually included in the price. Right. And so there's huge class action exposure for that because a lawyer, a smart lawyer, and there are a lot of lawyers who do nothing but sue car dealers and they're smart uh, and they have big houses. I've been to some of them. Uh, they can sue you for every single customer for, I think it's five years. For everybody who's wow. bought a car. I mean, the exposure is incredible. And it's a simple screenshot. And that's your, there's your people's exhibit A. That's it. That's it. It's... Uh, Does that happen a lot? Uh, I haven't seen many class actions over that issue. I'm not sure why exactly. But I haven't seen many class actions over that issue. Lots of class actions over the Fair Credit Reporting Act. But uh, we're running out of time, so I'll have to talk about that next time you have me on the show. That sounds great. Wow. An hour just goes so fast. It does. Well, Tom, I appreciate you spending Sunday night with us. 
You shared a lot of great information. I hope it was eye-opening uh, for some, because like I said, in, in 41 plus years, uh, a lot of the stuff that you suggest be done every two weeks or monthly, I've never seen done. So I would imagine that, um, you know, just like a leopard doesn't change its spots, I would imagine that the problem is still ongoing in a lot of stores. And what's that thing? You don't know what you don't know? Right. That's right. So it kind of, it kind of makes a lot of sense to reach out to a guy like you, but at the very least have a conversation, have an assessment to see where they're at. There's one of two things is going to come from that. Either A, you're doing a great job, keep doing it, or B, here are the areas of concern and here's what it potentially could cost you. Is that something you'd like to explore? It's right. very, very simple. Right, absolutely. It's not like you're selling somebody something. You're going over laws and regulations and exposure and, and you're either within or not. Right. Right. Very Great true. stuff. If you could, after the show's over, just go into the uh, the post on my profile, because that's the main profile there. Just in the comment section, put your contact information, uh, your website, and I think you have two websites, right? Uh, I have uh, alwaysdobetter.com slash how we help, which is about the digital comment box. But the main yeah. site is bettervantagepoint.com. All right. If you could put all the links and all your contact info in there, that would be great because, you know, I say this all the time. I always remember what I forgot to ask when I had the opportunity to do so. So rather than have to go crazy and look for it, if it's there, then I can easily find it, pick up the phone and call you. And anybody could obviously reach out to me as well. I'm happy to connect you with Tom. So Tom, thanks again. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate the support every week. And have a successful and safe week. And we'll see you next week on Sunday Night Live. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us, everyone.